Hello, everybody. This is Stephen Gardner, best-selling author of Taming Wall Street, and I have another great interview for you, like I always do. But I'm talking to my friend here, Mr. Ray Ross, who is the owner and founder of Financial Literacy One-on-One. -on -one. Uh, if you're seeing this, it's probably because you're already a fan of his, or maybe YouTube is introducing you to this and you're seeing him and myself for the first time. But Ray, thank you for being on this interview today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I know we're doing it on my channel because I wanted to go live, but thank you nonetheless for having it done this way. And hopefully um, we, we, both, we both do well on both channels. So people get this information and grow from there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, today, what I wanted to talk about is, you know, you and I both come from different backgrounds. Uh, neither of us grew up with wealthy families. Uh, you, you grew up, I believe, on the East Coast. I grew up in uh, Boise, Idaho and, and Utah, so the, the Midwest kind of country. Uh, so I wanted to just give some perspective to both of our, our subscribers on how do you escape poverty, right? Like, when we come out of this coronavirus, it's going to be a whole new economy. And Definitely. there's going to be people that make a ton of money during this time. And there's going to be a lot of people that slip back into poverty or further into poverty. And I don't want to see that. I don't think you want to see that. And that's why you I and know. I, for free, get on here and share this information. But when, when you think about the words uh, escaping poverty, what comes to your mind? Freedom. Freedom comes to mind because poverty for me in the way I grew up was prison. And it's still in prison for a lot of um, friends and family that have a sort of mind, mindset that they can't do better than what they're currently yet. And that has to do um, with so much of information, education, and politics that really keeps the mind manipulated on the, how the way we view those three sectors. And I, I believe because growing up, everybody, most majority of um, African-Americans from my point of view are Democrats for whatever reason that may be, right? Because the Democrats really try to speak to the African-American community and try to speak of the benefits and things they will do for us, which is untrue. Um, it's been proven before the 1960s, Democrats have not done anything for the African-American community. Um, and, and matter of fact, if people will go back and just do their history, I don't wanna lead um, the horse to water on this, but in retrospect, if they look, they have instilled and um, implied a lot of racial uh, things that really cap black people for being successful. And I'm not saying to vote Republican either. What I'm saying is this, what I, what I realized that race has a little bit to do with it. It's about the financial divide, right? Because um, yeah, LeBron's house, even though he's a millionaire, super, you know, super rich guy, people might put the N word on his house but he still lives in a rich neighborhood and he still gets benefits and protections from living in that rich neighborhood. So that, that is how my channel started. Like first it was my money makes money, then it was financial literacy one-on-one. -on -one. And it's because of the financial divide that also encompasses race. And I think if we, as a community, um, it doesn't, as a poor community, as a middle-class community, understand the financial divide and also how that ties into race, we'll be freeing our minds and we will eventually escape poverty. See, when rich people talk to poor people, right? They don't call you poor because they'll say less fortunate or the middle class, but they're basically saying people who are beneath me, they want to marginalize you and keep you in a sector that keeps them rich. The richer people become, the less rich the rich becomes and they don't want that because all the benefits they get from being rich, the popularity, the fame, the services, the perks, all of that decreases when more people become wealthy. Why would I want that? I, I wanna be um, isolated 
in this rich bubble that gives me all the benefits and perks. Like if I'm an ugly guy who's rich, well, I'm pretty, I'm handsome now because I have money, yeah. right? If I'm a fat guy um, and ugly, but I'm rich, guess what? I am handsome to a female who's probably gorgeous, who's totally out of my league. So yeah. I, I think that, and unfortunately I'm speaking right now to the African-American community, if we will get our eyes off of the capitalization of race and move towards to finances and, and building upon that, we essentially become free. Now, is racism and all those things going to occur? Definitely. But, but there's a lot of things that change when the amount you have in your bank account change. Yeah, I think, um, and tell me, tell me if you think that this is right. Um, I, I feel like sometimes the media only portrays uh, successful African American people, if they're in like the sporting world, definitely, and it, and it kind of gives this misconception uh, to the community of if you're not good at sports, you're not going to have any money, and yes. and and so it's like uh, Tony Robbins says, you know, success leaves clues, but if the media is only the only clue they're leaving is you got to be a, a great singer or great at some kind of sports to, to get out of poverty, then I don't think people develop that abundant mentality of I, I can do it based on being a hard worker. I can, I can do it based on going after the opportunities uh, that are available through education, through self-education, through business ownership. I, I think a lot of those get muted because the media only portrays uh, like singers and sports stars. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, wow. You're, you're trying to open up a whole can of worms <laughs> on me, man. I'm telling you, I got so much stuff just loaded. I'm like a shotgun. I'm ready. Pow! But, um, <laughs> but um, that's a really good point, Stephen. And to speak to that, um, here's the thing. It goes back to marginalizing a group of people, just saying that you are only good at this. Well, um, fortunately, um, people, that we are good at everything. Now, because of how we grew up in the neighborhoods that we grew up, even our parents, even society, even the community pushes us towards those things where we always looking to do what? Get rich quick. Yeah. And the problem is in trying to play basketball and football and sing and comedy, there's still a bit of work. And most people, you know, one out of a million people become a pro athlete. So what are, what are your chances are uh, taking out a grant, applying for loans to go to college? Now, I really don't like the loan process because it keeps you in debt for the rest of your life. That's why I push people towards trade schools and certification, something you can pay off in three to five years or even less, just depending. So that mindset is a, is a manipulative mindset. And believe it or not, I believe it's a slave mentality speaking to the title that you have new world order how to escape poverty the new world order is to keep marginalized people marginalized in a mind frame that they get stuck at oh you know i didn't make it as a pro athlete so i might as well sell drugs i didn't make it as a singer i might as well sell drugs or i might as well just keep working at the local Popeyes, where that mindset of the white man is keeping me down or the system is against me. Let me tell you something. Uh, you can be as great as you want to be great. I used to think that the, the success of black people is dictated by a crate or by a, a sort of a sponge where only a little bit of us see through, but it was the lack of information. It was a lack of education. And when I speak about education, it has nothing to do with traditional schooling. Okay, um, information and education is, um, I, did a, I did a video the other day, is basically being a financial expert, that you know, self-taught financial expert. It's one of the best ways to understand money free and to grow and multiply the amount of, you know, a dollar to $10. Yeah. So I don't like to get into conspiracy theories when it comes to new world order, but there is an order of, of sorts. And we need to not so much pay attention of, oh, I belong to this political party, so I need to vote this way. 
I'm going to tell you what it's about. It's about individualism, not collectivism. It's about individualism because what they do is they put us in a collective. They put us in the community and say, oh, I'm talking to my minorities. I'm talking to minorities that we're going to give you relief. We're going to give you health care. Here's the thing. If you, if you want to become a small business owner and you're being forced to give your, uh, your patron, your workers, a health care plan that is going to uh, really hurt your business, would you vote Democrat? See, I think what we need to do is find out first what we want to do in life. What, what, what path to success do you want to do in life? Then look at your political views. Because I promise you, a lot of times when people want to start businesses, they might, you know what, I've been a Democrat all my life, but been a Democrat, been an independent, or even been a Republican is not something that's beneficial for me. They want us to think in a community mindset, but not in an individual mindset. Because when I get you in a community, then I can speak to you and I can marginalize you, even though... I'm speaking to the poor black neighborhood, the middle class black neighborhood, the poor white neighborhood, the middle class white neighborhood. I have you guys divided and you're not talking, but I also have all you votes because when I go do my town hall meeting, I'm talking to you and I'm talking to you, but I'm speaking in a way that I know you guys won't speak together and you won't think for yourself. You were like, yeah, I'm, yeah, he talking about us, girl. Yeah, no. Think about yourself first. Think about your family first. That is when individual comes into the mindset of business and the financial divide of money. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. I, I just want to stop for one second. Anybody that's listening to this, uh, if you're not already subscribed to Financial Literacy, subscribe right now. Uh, you're going to get some great stuff from, uh, from Ray. Uh, you can also look me up, Stephen Gardner, and subscribe to my channel. Definitely. So let, let's, um, I, I want to ask this, um, do you think that, um, you know, black or white or Asian, whatever you want to say, let, let's just talk about poverty for a second. Do you think that most people that are, you know, stuck in these minimum wage jobs or lower end jobs, do you think that they're aware of the fact that there's nearly 3 million trade jobs out there? that pay over $60,000? I don't believe so. I believe, again, that poverty is a lack of information and education. I, I really do think that. And even though some of these people that are working these, these fast food joints, um, these low income jobs, they have aspirations, they have uh, ideas and thoughts of starting their own business or inventing a product or wanting to be a plumber, electrician, a nurse, um, all these trades that the industry is actually lacking because everybody is working virtually. Everyone is a gig worker. Everyone is doing something um, digital or electronic. Where guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we still need electricians. We still need plumbers. Because guess what? If something goes wrong with my plumbing, I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, and I don't, don't want to do it. I don't, don't want to. Do I don't it. care if there's a coronavirus. If that toilet backs up, you're calling somebody, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and so um, to your point, Stephen, that we really um, need to give people that charge because some people like information, some people like um, education, but a lot of people, especially in low poverty neighborhoods, they lack inspiration and motivation. Okay, so let. Let, let's talk about that. Uh, I, I'm going to give a little background on myself, if that's okay. But sure. I, want you to, I want you to think about when you were growing up. So under the age of 18, if you could look back at yourself as a young man, who were your money mentors? Okay. So um, you, <laughs> I'm, that's why I'm giving you some time. That's why I'm giving you some time. I'll share mine. Okay. So you're probably familiar with the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? By Indeed. Robert Kidd. Okay. So I kind of grew up in that same situation. Uh, my, my dad never made a lot of money, but he was home every night and he was a good dad. Uh, my mother was a school teacher and uh, we, we never had a, a lot of money. I, one of my favorite memories of my mother is um, when, when, when you were growing up, did you have the, the clothing store Mervyn's? Does that sound familiar? 
What is it called again? Mervins. On, on the West Coast, it would be like similar to Coles. Um, or like a Macy's. Anyway, you know, it, I re for some reason I just remember Sears. Uh, okay, so it was like it was like Sears. It was like okay, Sears, okay. but it was in California, Idaho, Utah, and we we would go in when I was a young man. We'd go in, and my mother would say this almost every time: "Go ahead and look around, and then pick something off the discount rack." Right? It's, it, it's one of my favorite memories. And and then she would also like there would be like, you know, other moms or whatever. I'd come out in a pair of jeans. She'd stick her hand in the front of my jeans and then shake them to make sure there was enough room to grow. I remember just being so embarrassed that she would do this. Um, but <clears throat> when I, so when I was growing up though, I had a scout master who was uh, incredibly uh, successful. He made good money. He had real estate, multiple businesses. And uh, so I got to be around this guy every week and I, I would go to church with him. And while the other kids were goofing off, uh, I would be picking his brain on real estate. I'd be asking him about interest and, and he would teach me about debt and different things. And so I, I, I grew up with, like I said, a, a good dad, uh, but I also had this like money mentor, okay? And, and he would teach me things. I remember he would tell me, Stephen, you need to be on the right side of the interest equation. So you need to be earning interest and not having bad debt that takes interest away from you, right? That's costing you interest. I, I would learn things like that. I would learn the value of being a business owner versus a W-2 employee or having some kind of side income uh, if I was a W-2 employee. And, and so I, I was, I was, you know, I don't know what else to say, but blessed. I was blessed to have this mentorship as, as a young man where I was learning these skills through the Boy Scout program, but then I had access to someone who had money who, you know, I, I'm sure there was times he went home and was like, oh my gosh, I wish Stephen Gardner was shut up. You know, he just, <laughs> he just keeps asking me all these questions, but I had a very, I had a very curious mind. I, I now have an 11 year old son. He's the same way. It's like, it's like 500 questions a day. Um, but that, so that was, you know, I, I grew up going, okay, I don't know what I'm going to do for a profession. I worked at a bagel shop for two and a half years. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Uh, but I, I had some of these seeds planted and I saw people that had money that had businesses, that had multiple pieces of real estate. And so I, I grew up with that uh, belief or idea that I could have something like that if I applied myself. I didn't know how to do it, uh, but, but I grew up with some of that. So maybe, you know, think, think back to when you were a young man. Did, did you have any of that kind of mentorship or someone that you could speak with? Um, yeah, but... Let's just say we grew up differently. <laughs> okay. So um, give, um, give me a little background said, on you. Okay. So, you know, with that said, um, when, it came, when it came to money and mentorship, um, I, I would say that the information, some a lot of it was correct in the way I, th I should think about money, but it came from the wrong environment. Okay. Um, an uncle of mine, I won't say his name, <laughs> he's, he's still alive, <laughs> but he used to pick me up maybe like uh, once a month, every other weekend, take me over his house. He, he, had, he, he had a lot of money. Um, and I started to ask him questions about how he got his money. Now, he was in the, you know, uh, cocaine business. I'll just say oh, that. Okay. <laughs> and, and I told him, I asked him, I said, well, how do you get all this, you know, money selling drugs? And he said, well, you buy the product at a lower, a lower amount than which you um, actually pay for it at. And then he was teaching me, I'm not trying to teach people how to do this, by the way, disclaimer, just for educational yeah, no, purposes, but, ladies but, and gentlemen. Yeah, but you're saying purposes. how to turn a dollar into $5 as a business. Exactly, yeah, and how yeah. to, you know, the reason why he will cut it and this, that, and the other. And I said, well, how do you keep all this money and buy all these clothes and cars and this, because he always had money. He just always had a lot of money. And he was basically saying how he will save money for the future because um, one day he wanted a house and one day he wanted this. Um, but, but basically the only financial information I, I really ever received 
um, below the age of 18 uh, was one, because um, my mom passed away when I was 12. So it was mainly my aunt and um, other family members. They were like, oh, once you go out there and rake some white people, you know, yard and shovel snow. And I actually did that. So I I've been working since the age of eight, if I can remember, but it was mostly manual labor, you know, raking leaves, shoveling snow. I'm a kid. So, you know, that's pretty cool. But the information, that was the only information that I got from a very negative way of learning about money, but it stayed with me to the point where I knew that if I bought, like I always use my, my shades example, it's one of the freshest things in my mind, okay. is buy a product at a lower price and sell it higher than what you received it and you'll receive a profit. And then from that profit, you figure out other ways how to multiply that amount. And that's literally the only financial information I've ever received in my family. Okay. Um, whereas though, um, the excuses of not being wealthy, profitable, or having the knowledge base and education was always pointing the finger at somebody of the opposite color. Okay. Right. And I think you have to do a self actualization of yourself by looking in the mirror and say, okay, yeah, all these systemic racism, racial biases, you know, all these racial things, people being racist, but are there still ways out of poverty? And the answer is simply yes. Because even if you work for Popeyes or McDonald's or Burger King or uh, your secretary somewhere making $12 an hour, can you still build wealth over the course of time with the right information and education? Yes, you can. And that is where the ceiling, actually that, that is where we're really hard capped. Right before we get to the point of, I had this job but I am spending it at such a rate that I can't multiply it, right? Because I'd encourage people like, hey, yeah, you may be working at a low budget job. You may be um, working at a low end job. Get a roommate, move in uh, with two or three other people, figure out how you want to start your business. Because here's the thing, when you move in with somebody, you free up your finances a little bit. Yeah. You don't have the same bills. When you guys are all working at the same Popeyes, Right. And you guys can buy your money to a sense of, OK, um, we're going to pay a third of the rent. Boom. We're going to split all the bills equally. Then the amount you had once before grows exponentially. So I, I, I think that mind frame, we really need to get into that mind frame of I, it's OK to struggle, but not always. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We, we are always in the survival mode. That's one thing that. Um, um, low impoverished neighborhoods learn how to do. They learn how to survive. That is actually a very bad thing because they're never learning how to thrive. They're never learning how to succeed, right? And, and a lot of this has to do with being marginalized um, in political and government. But a lot of times it has to do with oneself. Don't get me wrong. I am, I am not saying that uh, the racial biases and um, us not being picked up for certain jobs and things like that doesn't exist. It does. Yeah. But it has to come a time where we can say that, but we need to be doing something different. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I believe it does exist. I, I don't know how to get rid of that except for just every generation, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get better, but um, let's talk about, okay. So <clears throat> thanks for giving that, that background. Um you know, I, I think what your your uncle was teaching you was positive, but it was in like a negative environment, like you said. So, OK, so now you're not 18 anymore. Um, you, you, you're growing up. When when did you start uh, taking it upon yourself to become financially literate and financially educated? And, and what were the steps? And then I'll talk about my own. OK, this is a. Uh... Um, the, the, the way how my mind started to really transform, I was working as a furniture mover. Okay. And I was getting paid under the table, um, $25 an hour. I was between the age of 20 and 22. I was getting paid. Uh, this was a summer job as I, um, going my semester, I was in college and you would think that college would teach you financial literacy. No, 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 no. It, it, it does not. Um, but in doing that job, I was getting paid 
$25 an hour, working 12 hours a day, six days a week. So I had an enormous amount of money. Yes. And yeah. I was literally blowing every single dollar, right? I bought a fat ride. I was partying Saturday nights, Sunday nights, because I had work on Monday again. I was splurging. I was buying people drinks. I was just buying the club out. And a driver asked me one time, one of the truck drivers asked me, he worked for Mayflower. He says, what are you doing with all this money that you're receiving under the table that most people would get taxed? And you probably receive only like $18 of this money an hour. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, you know, I'm just having a great time and I'm doing this, that, and the other. He said, well, you're in school, right? I said, yeah. He said, are you paying for your, uh, are you paying for your school with the money? I said, well, no, I have a scholarship. He said, okay, so what are you doing to set, uh, set yourself up for success later on? And I just stopped. And I said, um, I, um, I got a little bit in the bank. I was speechless because I didn't have an answer. No one really just challenged me on, you have all of this money, what are you doing with it? And when he challenged me, I didn't have a great comeback. So I said, oh man, you know, I'm just living my life. He said, so what happens when you stop living your life? I said, well, I'll be dead. He said, no, when you stop having fun and reality kicks in, you have to actually live. And that would actually got the ball, you know, ball rolling, my mind twirling about, okay, let me first start saving. Then I started getting to in college where I saw rich people um, like, hey, you know, how do you drive this? And why are you, how, how are you affording these clothes? So I just started asking questions. That's how I really got started. Cause I saw people wearing like nice clothes, like where I'm from, we were with people like a cliche and call urban clothes or street clothes. That was fashionable to me. But I saw people wearing like really nice, you know, shirts and pants and shoes. I'm like, well, how much is that? Oh, these shoes are $200. How can you afford $200 pair of shoes? And now that I think about it, just like anybody can pay for a pair of Jordans. But nonetheless, I started to ask those questions. And they said, oh, well, my father invests or he saves a lot of money. And that is really what got the ball started for me to say, you know what? I lived in Southeast DC where um, for summers on end, summers all year round, I would hear people getting shot, people getting killed, where joining the army, joining the Marine Corps was second nature for me because I already knew what to do when people started to shoot guns. I mean, yeah. most people with natural reactions to hit the ground, but it was almost to the point where I was getting complacent because I knew there was a shooting going to happen. And one thing I understood that I didn't want to be there anymore. Yeah. I didn't want to keep it gangster. I didn't want to keep it hood. I wanted to get to a point where I didn't want to live in a neighborhood where I didn't know if I was going to get killed walking out my door because there was a drive by or other people was looking for some other people and I was in the wrong place at the, at the wrong time. I didn't want that life. So I knew that the answer was money. Do you have the money to afford to live in a better neighborhood. It doesn't mean white neighborhood. It doesn't mean uh, uh, um, black or, or, you know, some sort, it meant, can I live in a better place where people, doesn't matter the color, because they have the same issues in trailer parks. That's predominantly white. It, it depended on what can I afford to live in a better neighborhood, regardless yeah. of uh, socially and uh, racial divide. It's a line between poor and rich. Yeah, so uh, I just, I wrote a note down. Uh, for you, it was this question that made you stop and think, when do I stop living for the moment and start building for the future? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, that, I mean that's powerful stuff. I, I think, because you did a video on this, right? People would rather look rich than be rich, right? Yes. And yes. wouldn't you say that a lot of those people, uh, they, they just haven't stopped living for the moment. Um, you know, there's just this, you know, I don't know what the next thing's gonna be. Obviously I didn't grow up in an area here in gunshots unless it was hunting season or something. But yeah. um, so just that, that living for the moment. Now I'll share my own story here in a minute. Uh, but if, if you're watching this live and you're not subscribed to financial literacy, please subscribe right now. 
Uh, you can also look me up, Stephen Gardner, and subscribe to my channel. Um, speaking, speaking of ways out, did you feel like where you grew up that, um, you know, sports or music wasn't the way out, but did you feel like joining the military was, was the way out of poverty or did you just do that? Oh, oh no. Um, first, first and foremost, the military is, is not even a choice where I'm from. No one speaks about joining the military. Nobody. Okay. It, it was, uh, I'm gonna make it to pro football. I'm gonna make it to pro basketball. Oh, I can rap, so I'm gonna be a rapper. Um, Cause I've been through all of that. I actually sponsor a rap group in my early twenties. Okay. Um, their name were the Untouchables. It was a guy from Detroit who could really rap his butt off. Okay. Um, a guy from Jersey and a guy from New York. Um, I was a producer. I used to, I went up to New York 50 times in one year, try to get them on the radio, try to get them known. So that stereotype, unfortunately is true. Cause I played football cause it was fun. But then I said, well, if I become a pro, I'll be, I'll be rich. So I started working hard at doing that, you know, getting, being faster. My, my 40 time was a four, seven. I got it down to a four, four, which helped me land my scholarship. Okay. So there's a, a lot of things in the African-American community that really pushes us towards these very niche and stereotypical um, genres that only one out of a million in the entire country is going to make it. So yes, play sports, have fun, but hit the books, get the information, expand your mind. Don't be afraid to read. That is the most common thing that I see as a community from my point of view and my perspective. I could be totally wrong, but this is my point of view. Growing up at the high school, people did not want to better themselves by the way of a book. And that is where all the information is. Do they understand that during slavery, uh, the slave masters did not want us to read because they knew that it would expand our minds and we would have power with their own words to um, negotiate, to fight, to uh, liberate, to, to um, 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 march and, and do all the things to uh, put us in a higher place than we once were. We were illiterate, yes the boss, yes the master. And that's all they want us to, to actually learn. So that's why I encourage people um, that listen to me, whether it be on my channel, at work, walking, talking to random people, you got to read. I, sometimes I don't like to read. I got an app that actually helps me to at least read 20 minutes a day, oh, okay. right? Because, yeah, because, yeah, do I like TV? Oh, I love TV. I was watching this show. Never mind. But, <laughs> but that's, that's my point. I, I don't want to get off topic because I, okay. I can go. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, uh, so I'll give a little background on myself and, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, <clears throat> so again, diff different backgrounds, but this is good. This is how you learn from people is different backgrounds. Definitely. So uh, when most people were partying and starting maybe into college or, or finding that first job, uh, I actually went on a, a Christian service mission for two years. Uh, this was right after 9-11. Oh, <laughs> Uh, th this is, was right after 9-11, and um, I, I went to Puerto Rico, and you know, I suddenly found myself a, a, a white guy surrounded by Puerto Ricans. I didn't speak any Spanish, um, and I had to learn the language, and, and you know, I learned a lot through serving, and I learned a lot of what not to do, what I didn't want to see. Uh, but the reason I asked you about the, the military being the way out is for a lot of Puerto Ricans, joining the military is their way out of poverty. It's their way mm. off the island. And so I, I, that's, that's where that question came from. So uh, I got married at the age of 22. Okay. Uh, I just celebrated my 15 year anniversary yesterday. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. Um, we've got, we've got three kids. And, uh, so I married really young, which, you know, yeah. most people that marry that young, they end up in poverty they or do. they, they don't know how to move forward. And, and I was fortunate to, to not, you know, fall into that trap, but got married young. I got right into a house. So it took me seven years to get my college degree. And I did not come out a doctor, <laughs> uh, but it was because I was working, a, I was working a full-time job. And then I would, I would go up to the university of Utah for night school. 
by the time I drove home, it was 11 o'clock at night. I was exhausted. I would sit down, crack open the books, uh, maybe watch a 20 minute show with my wife. I'd go to bed, I'd wake up, I'd, hit, I'd get to the office at seven in the morning. So I, I was just like hitting it all the time. I, I was exhausted, but I, I knew I did not want to uh, fail as a provider. Uh, and, and I wanted to have a, a family and, and chase that American dream. But what really took off for me was uh, when I was around age 25. Uh, now, I, I grew up thinking that I was stupid. The, the school system told me I was stupid. Okay. Um, I, I didn't do well with my grades. I had uh, behavioral issues. Uh, now, this is a blessing, but I had a talking problem. I was never a bad kid, right? I never got into a fight in school. Um, I, I was not, I didn't cheat. I didn't, you know, but I had a talking problem. But that translated to you're bad, you're stupid, right? And it wasn't until I was 25 years old that somebody said to me, uh, have you ever considered the fact that you're an auditory learner? And I was like, what are you talking about? Because he had given me this book on astronomy uh, that, was, mm -hmm. you, that you listened to, right? Kind of like Audible today, but Audible didn't exist yeah, yeah, back yeah. then. So anyway, but I, I'm like talking to him and he's like, how do you remember all of this stuff? And I was like, well, I listened to the book. And, and so anyway, it was the first time it dawned on me that I might be smart. It took me till I was 25 years old, right? And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, I, like once that confidence shifted in me, I, I started just devouring books, book after book after book. And because I was interested in money as a, as a young kid, uh, I started digging into, you know, rich dad, poor dad, um, automatic book. millionaire, um, bank on yourself. I mean, I just started becoming a voracious reader. And, and absorbing all I could. This was before YouTube and, and audiobooks, really. Um, and so uh, I, I'm with you. My, my, my path out of what should have been uh, a young guy that married too young and had kids at a young age uh, should have been poverty. I believe it was reading and finding good mentors that helped me mm -hmm. escape what should have been, what feels like should have been my destiny. Uh, and so you, you feel like, you know, reading was, was, you know, probably one of your best tricks for getting out of the rat race and, and out of that poverty cycle. The, the best, the best thing is reading. The best thing is information and education. Um, because when we, when we talk about the new world order, right, we can talk about how there is uh, one or 2% of the population that are filthy rich. And some of these people, um, are actually African-American as well that I believe, right? The black bourgeois and also the Caucasian counterparts. And with that being said, you have to have, in, in order to have rich people, there has to be a financial divide. And just like one of the popes who actually switched the narrative of who would be slaves and who wouldn't, wouldn't be slaves, he switched it to black people because we were easily Distingu uh, distinguishable, I mean, dealing with our color and our characteristics. Yeah. Okay. So in America, it's mostly um, Hispanics and African-Americans because we are very easy to pick out. Because um, if you go, you know, during um, the Holocaust days or the Holocaust time, Jewish people wasn't that really um, easily distinguishable unless they yeah. had like a certain size nose, certain features. But yeah. some of them, if they knew German, they could actually... Um, blend in if they wanted to, because some of them actually got away that way. Yeah. We can't blend in nowhere, yeah. right? We're, and, and, and when we talk about the Chinese who work for a particular railroad, who um, stretch across railroads throughout, um, throughout America, and then the African-Americans who actually build railroads throughout America, the reason why Chinese got a better hand than we did in America is because they had a home country. Right. We are cut off. It's kind of like if we were a baby and we have a umbilical cord where we got the nurture and, new, you know, the nurture and um, the health was cut because okay. we can't relate to anybody. We are three to four generations away from our homeland, uh, let alone our home country, let alone our home tribe. We don't know who we are. Right. Yeah. A lot of times people will say in order to map your future. You have to know your past. You have to know your history. 
Yeah. Because it gives you pride. It gives you inspiration. And so a lot of times I think that us as African-Americans, we go back to slavery. We go back to slavery. We go back to slavery. Well, who were we before slavery? And a lot of people like to say, oh, we were kings and queens and this, that, and the other. Let's, let's dive deeper. We were yeah. businessmen. We were trades. A lot of our people were Moorish, where they travel the world and they deal in trade. They help uh, the Romans and Greeks to build um, um, sanitation and source systems. Because before us, they, they didn't have those things in place. So that is the information, not only dealing with money, because it all relates back to money. What about Mansa Musa, the most richest man in the world to this day? He was going around different places, just handing out gold. This is the information that we need. First of all, who are you? Where are you from? Yeah. Then we can move forward because... I think if you always go back to slavery and you say, well, I'm black, I'm from, my, my ancestors were slaves. No, your ancestors were businessmen, doctors, scientists, uh, inventors. These are your people. Then the whole, I'm not going to get so deep into the whole what happened, but we know. Um, then that time occurred. So let's move forward from that. Let's talk about you're here. How do we make this money? You know, I'm, I'm, and, and, and we get so bog, boggled down. We get so capitalized on, oh, well, you know, I did this. No, what are you doing to set yourself in a higher, a higher plane where you can catapult yourself in a better, in a, in a better uh, hierarchy? And for me, it was literally picking up books regardless of what they look like. Now, I, I like, I don't want, I'm not trying to offend you with this book, but this is a really good book. Okay. Because essentially, uh, this is Black Labor, White Wealth by Dr. Claude Anderson. And it really tells you a lot of things that was happening during, um, right after slavery and Jim Crow, but okay. a lot of things that also that we can move from. Because people like him are successful because of the things that they, they took the same systems that were in place by white America to marginalize us to actually help himself to be part of another class. So I think it's the information and it's the education that we're lacking. Even though we have all these other things against us, at a point you just gotta say, man, time out for excuses, time yeah. out. Yeah, no, that, that, that was actually very insightful to me. You know, yeah. um, I don't pretend to understand the struggles of uh, black people, um, you know, but that actually what you just said is was profound. Um, if if I look back at my heritage, I can trace it all the way back through New York. I can trace it back to England and Scotland um, and, you know, through through Europe. And, and I think that you, you can too, but if, if they get hung up on the, the slavery thing, um, I just think, you know, for me, that was really eye-opening what you just said. Um, yeah, I, I think with us though, um, if I don't use 23andMe or Accessory.com, I don't know if I'm from Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Togo, South Africa, the Ivory Coast, Senegal, uh, Mozambique, Casablanca, uh, Morocco, Morocco, the Arab, the Arab Emirates, which is actually North Africa. We don't know where we come from, yeah. so we lack this sense of pride, and we believe. And this is this is this is actually just a weird. Um, it, it gets me kind of. It kind of gets me infuriated because there's this notion out there that our African brethren hate us because we grew up in America and Ameri African Americans like, oh, those Africans, um, they, they blah, blah, blah. It, it's like all this controversy. And I'm like, listen, our ancestors are from Africa. They got put in slavery and then we're the descendants of that. I don't have anything against my African brother. I love them. I want to know more about them. And I, I would wish that they would want to know, know more about us. But growing up, I actually heard Africans from different parts of the continent say, you guys are privileged. Your education is free. We have to pay for this. You guys are lazy because you should be 
successful. And guess what? They do have a certain point because they come over here and they build businesses and they do fairly well. But there are some things that they don't really understand that occurred that they need to do our history as we're learning our history from their history, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So I wish that we can, um, uh, dealing with Pan-Africanism and combining Africa and African-Americans together, that we will get from the place that we are to the place that we need to be. Because essentially, I can tell you this, I'm not racist in any sort of the manner. Do I have prejudice? I believe that we all have prejudice and some stereotypes. And stereotypes can be good and stereotypes can be negative. But I can tell you this, if you continue to make excuses for yourself and blame everybody else, then you will always, always be unsuccessful, poor, angry, uh, and you will essentially be a degenerate. That's just yeah. my opinion. Yeah, uh, I, no, this, is, uh, this is good stuff. Uh, if you're just tuning in right now, uh, make sure that to subscribe to Financial Literacy 101. You can also subscribe to my channel. Just look me up, Stephen Gardner, on YouTube. Um, let, let's just go a few more minutes and then and then we'll we'll wrap it up if that's okay. So okay. Uh, a, as we come out of um, as we come out of this coronavirus, I think mm -hmm. people are going to have to. Um, you know, they're, they may have to reinvent themselves. Let, let's talk for a minute about um, just, you know, I don't want to use the word budgeting because I hate the word budgeting, but being, <laughs> being smarter with your money, creating that margin where you can actually uh, put money into a Robin Hood account or put money into a Taming Wall Street insurance contract or save up money in an emergency fund what, what are your thoughts coming out of this? Because uh, I, I kind of see two ways of, of really arriving at retirement. You can focus everything on being a really great saver and investor, uh, or you can focus on minimizing your debt. And maybe you don't have a ton of money in retirement, but you also don't have a lot of monthly debt payments because you paid off your house and your cars and different things. So at, as people come out of this coronavirus, what, what are your thoughts? What are going to be some of the top things that people need to look at as far as, you know, getting a, a solid foundation under them and then building on that so that they can have that future of their dreams? And then I'll, I'll give some thoughts as well. Everyone, we have to be financially conservative. That's the answer. Some people say, I don't have enough money to live day to day where they actually do, when they actually do. And I think about this in a financial conservative way, because let's say for instance, I, I, I pay all my bills, I pay, I put my $20 in savings a month and I have $10, $30 left, right? I have a low amount of money left. Do I go out and buy a bag of chips? Do I go out and buy a soda? Do I go out and buy some sort of uh, inexp uh, inexpensive or, uh, some sort of gadget. With that $10, with that $30, could I invest it in Robinhood or Stash? Yes, I could. And I, and I think that is the hallmark of, of a certain mind frame is that with the rest of the money, once we pay our bills, I just want to have fun. I just want to live my life. I, you know, yeah. I, I'm not having fun. So I worked my butt off this week. And so now I'm going to have fun. I think what people forget is um message you're going to get old and you're going to need money to live okay and if you don't start saving up for your future and here's a misconception of a 401k oh i do a 401k so i should be okay well how much of the 401k you're doing uh that's another thing if you read tony robinson's book unshakable look at all the hidden fees that are in 401ks and mutual funds. So is that advantageous for your um, financial portfolio? Maybe not, but is it an avenue or a path that you can take to get you where you need to be? Yes, because the national consensus of having enough money is anywhere between 1.2 million to 2 million after the age of 62 slash 65. So we have to be financially conservative now. And I like, I like this from um, the information you get 
about Stephen, about infinite banking, about using uh, life insurance cash value account to grow your wealth without penalty, without loss in the, the last 100 years dealing with a company like Penn Mutual. I'm still looking at over, Stephen. I'm not, you know, I'm still looking at playing over. I'm looking at some finances. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, growing your money anywhere uh, between uh, 1% to 7% and it never goes below 0%. So I can lose a tremendous amount of money in the stock market. But if I use a cash value account where if I was to go buy a boat, buy a car, a motorcycle, a house, I can borrow against myself. And when that money is being deducted from that account, that if I have a cash value life insurance account, I can take that money out without penalty. But I have to pay it back with a small interest rate. But if I don't pay it back, I don't get hit. There's no, there's no uh, derogatory or special interest that I have to pay. And granted, when I take that 30 grand out, right, up to 90%, right? Am I correct? 90%? Yes. Yeah. You can take out 90%. So let's just for the, if I have $100,000, I can take out $90,000. Yeah. Yep. And with that $90,000, I can um, buy a house, um, start a business. And I don't essentially have to pay it back, but it's more advantageous to pay it back because we understand compounding interest. But you're borrowing the money from yourself. As long as you're paying that money back, your account is still growing off $100,000. That is phenomenal. This is what rich people do. Rich people don't just invest their money into commodities, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. They just don't do real estate. They do real estate. They flip homes. They buy, hold, and rent. They also do cash value life insurance account, which you offer with your business, which is which is a, a actual great avenue. So, yeah, go ahead and pro. Sorry, me. commercial, man. Commercial. <laughs> no, you're good. You which keep is showing good Amazon. Book. I got to show mine. I'm on Amazon. I got seven books on Amazon. <laughs> there you go. And Stephen, by the way, is encouraging me to write a book. I'm going to have to yes. be the person to type it up. But nonetheless, <laughs> these are the ways to become wealthy, successful, and eventually rich. But it goes back to my first point. In order to get to the point where you're investing or putting your money into a cash value account, you have to be financially conservative. Yeah, you got you to live within your means. And I think people's means might go down, which means living within your means might go down. I mean, my wife and I have talked about this. Do we need to cut dance for the girls? Do we need to uh, you know, scale back to a more conservative car. Uh, you know, we're, we're having these conversations now so that in 60, 90, 120 days, we can pull the trigger and make decisions so that, yeah. you know, when we get old, we can make those uh, decisions. I, I want to say something really quick. Go ahead. In, in 2008, I had, I hate 401ks. Uh, I mean, I'll just come right out and say it, man. And maybe I'm just, you know, bad taste in my mouth still, but in 2008, I lost almost 40% of my family's wealth in my 401k because of the Great Recession. So if I had $100,000... It was a dollar amount. You know I love dollar amounts. I know Come you on. do. I know you do. If I had $100,000, I had 60000 left. It just evaporated. And it took five and a half years to get back to where I was. So not only did I lose $40,000, I lost five and a half years of my life just to get back to break even. Now, all along the way, Wall Street was bragging about these big gains, but people weren't even back to where they were in 2008 for five and a half years, okay? You, you fast forward, I learned, I learned, and that's what, that's what I put in Taming Wall Street. Which is uh, a good book and an easy read. Thank you. Uh, my wife and I lost zero dollars. My clients, my don't do clients. That. Don't do that. I lost 30 grand during this pandemic. But go I know. I, I, I don't even call it pandemic. I call it pandemic. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that the other side, pandemic, I lost some money, you know. So, but I, I, I did, I, I, I lost uh, and I just told myself, I'm going to study where the wealthy are growing their money so that they're not losing. So they're not being raped in taxes. And, and I learned these things. And then I taught those to my clients. Now I've had other investments outside of Taming Wall Street that did like phenomenal. And I've had others that have lost me money. 
Uh, but when it comes to these strategies that I teach to my clients, I, I had people with 300,000, 500,000, they didn't lose a dime. I, I got a text from a doctor client of mine. He said, man, I, I didn't lose any money. My TD Ameritrade account lost a hundred grand. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And he's like, thank you for, for introducing me to this. So anyway, like uh, th this is kind of how I, I, I talk about this. I think it's in the book. Like I said, I've, I've got seven books, but do you remember there were these cartoons growing up where it would show somebody climbing the stairs and yes. then all of a sudden it would like slam flat and they would go sliding backwards in life, yeah. right? Yeah. I feel like that's that's what happens sometimes with 401ks and, and even with, if you don't really understand it, investing is you could be making all this great progress up, up the stairs and then all of a sudden, boom, they slam flat and you, you slide backwards several exactly. years. I, I can't agree with you more. Yeah, so, um, you know, not losing money will help people get out of poverty. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not trying to push an agenda. I've, I've showed my book, but that's not the point of this interview. Oh, oh don't worry. Like, I'll push it. If, <laughs> if, you, if you want to invest your money, um, you may not get the exact same interest rates as the stock market, like 20, 24%, but you're also not going to lose 20, 24%. Then contact Steven in, in his channel. And people know me. I don't really promote nobody. You know, because I have to have that trust with somebody, but you are a genuine guy that's doing um, really good things. And the program and the services that you provide are value. Okay. It's value added to any community where your money can grow um, anywhere from one to 7% without loss. That is just, if someone told me, say, Ray, I want you to save $100 in this account at 2%. And you'll never lose money. It will always be compounded and multiply. But somebody say, come along and say, well, I'm going to want you to invest your money in the stock market. But 50% of that is going to be um, wiped away when we have a recession, when we go through another depression. Which way do you think I will go? I will go where I never lose money. Now, yeah. granted, do I invest? Yes, I do. Because I believe there's multiple ways to success and there's multiple ways for wealth. Yeah. And I, and I have a Robin hood account as well. Um, you know, but I don't, I don't personally have the majority of my money inside of risky stuff. I, I have this solid foundation of things that, that I don't believe will ever lose any money. And then at the, at the top of the pyramid, you know, that's where I take my risks with real estate and, 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 uh, my, my stock investments, but having that good, uh, solid foundation, is really important. Now, I, I want to touch on one more thing, and then and then we'll we'll wrap it up. I appreciate your time. Oh, go ahead. Before you get to the point. Yeah, very very short. And here's another avenue um, to multiply someone's wealth. Do what the Chinese is doing. The Chinese is actually buying U.S. government bonds because U.S. government bonds are still in a surplus of um, of um, raising in value anywhere from one to four percent. So go buy bonds and bonds are essentially loans to the federal government and they're available. Go to treasurydirect.gov and that's another way where you can actually build your wealth. Again, yeah, it's two to 4%, but it's higher than 95% of the savings accounts. Yeah, no, I, uh, <clears throat> unless you think America is going away, that, that's a great, that's a great point uh, that, yeah. that you bring up. Um, okay, the last thing I want to share with people that I believe is so important for uh, escaping poverty, and especially as we come out of here, is I think more, and, and you, you feel free to disagree with me, um, but I, I think um, being a good saver is one of the most important skill sets that people can learn. Okay, now whether they're saving money at the bank or in a taming Wall Street or uh, in a Robin Hood account or, or wherever it is, I think that people have become so dependent on rate of return that they have stopped focusing on what they can bring to the table, right? Mm. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> most people don't know this, but um, the person who saves $10,000 at 5% versus the person who saves $5,000 at 10%. Did you know that it takes over 20 years 
for the person that gets 10% rate of return every single year to surpass the person who's a better saver at a lower interest rate? I do know that. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, I see this a lot, you know, cause I deal with like 500 families a year is people are like, Oh man, I got, I got to make that big money. I got to make that fast money. And, and so they're like, I'm going to put very little in and then I'm going to hope and pray and take risk to get this high rate of return instead of saying, okay, what can I control and how do I become a good saver? Now, I, I also believe you can't become wealthy without becoming an investor. I believe that. But, but this, yeah, but this skill set of being able to live under your means and take a portion of all that you earn and set it aside for you and your future self and your family, I think that is such an important skill set. But most people don't realize that. If, if I can save twice as much as you, even if you're getting 10 or 20% return, it takes decades for you and your earnings to catch up to what I can do just being a good saver. I have nothing to disagree with you about. I, okay. I totally I believe, I understand the math behind it. Yeah. And it's so simple that to a lot of people is going to be complicated. Yeah, and I, I know you understand it. It's the people listening to this that I, I just want that to sink in is like this, this becoming a good saver. Here, here's the other thing, right? And this will build self-esteem so fast for people at any level, poverty, middle class, whatever, is becoming a good saver gives you that sense of control of your own life, right? If you know I can consistently save 10% of what I earn, then all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, I have worth, I have value, I'm worth saving for the future, right? I'm worth setting some of my hard work aside because if you're not saving anything, then you're not, you're not living for yourself. You're living for Wells Fargo or the landlord or AT&T or Sprint or, or Comcast, whatever it is. You only go to work to pay them. You got to go to work to pay yourself too, right? So I think, go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, I, when you were speaking, it uh, just kind of sparked my, you know, sparked my thought about, you said you didn't like to say the word budget, right? Because when people think about budget, they think about um, that they're tamed or uh, that there's a cap or ceiling. A restriction. Um, there's some restriction. And, but creating a budget, right? Because essentially most people that I know, they live like this. They live in the dark. They don't <laughs> see what actually goes on in their finances, right? They check out everything else, right? How much gas they got in the tank. Um, you know, how much food they got in the refrigerator, how their kids' grades are doing, but they don't know how much money they're spending, how much money is actually coming in. And in order to do any sort of savings plan, you have to take the veil off. You have to take the blinders off because granted, we talked about what's the minimum amount that somebody would need to do a program like the cash value life insurance. You said $100. Well, let me tell you something. People in the chat room, they have a hundred dollars that they just blow. They do. Yeah. They have the hundred dollars, right? But they do other things with their money than actually do something profitable like yours. Now, and granted, I speak a lot about investment. I speak a lot about real estate. But if you just have a hundred dollars and you can't lose that hundred dollars, then your cash value life insurance account is the best way. Because if you are investing in the stock market, People say it's not gambling. And even I say it's not gambling because we're dealing with information. We're dealing with news. We're dealing with metrics. We're dealing with analyzation of stocks and companies and all the things that tie into a stock going up and down, right? Because essentially the stock market is an emotional beast. It deals with people's emotions. When I feel bad, I, I, I sell my investment. When I feel good, I buy my investment. So that's why it's always like this. It's emotions up and down every day. I'm mad at work. I'm happy at home. Vice versa. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, but when I get into an account like yours, I have um, a projected amount that I know I won't lose and a projected amount that I can possibly gain. Yeah. So that kills the emotion in that. I said, well, you know, I, I'm not going to lose any money, but the cash value life insurance account. So I might as well go ahead and put a couple of hundred in there a month. Yeah. But people are not thinking that way. We're thinking about getting rich 
quick. Yeah. Um, I'll just throw out an arbitrary number of only maybe 5% of the millionaires became millionaires like that. It yeah. took time for them to become rich. Like just the other couple of years ago, now granted, Jay-Z's always been rich, but he's super rich now. He's a billionaire. Yeah. So how did that take? A lot of good decisions, a lot of investments, but it took time. And people are trying to get rich so quick. The number one question that people ask me, hey, Rawls, where can I put my money in to make a lot of money? Yeah. That is the most vague question that somebody could ever ask me because this is so many avenues to success. Yeah, I, I get asked, where can I double my money fast or where can I 10X my money? And I'm like, you're talking to the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. You, you, you need to go talk to the other guy uh, who's willing to Call lose your money. Yeah. Call so, yeah, well, you know, um, the, just since you brought it up, the, the, the taming Wall Street strategy that I show uh, never loses money, grows every single year, you have liquid access to it, and you get to legally avoid taxes like a Roth IRA, right? There's nothing illegal. Legally avoid taxes. That is phenomenal. It's mind blowing. I can't even tell you how much I paid in taxes last year. I can tell you this. My tax return was $159. Yeah, I already know how much you've paid. Too much. <laughs> whatever, whatever the number is, it's too much, right? But um, you, you know, uh, another thing that's good about this is, uh, like, let, let's just compare it to a four hundred one k. If I put in over, let's say, over ten years, I put fifty thousand dollars in a four hundred one k, and it's grown to uh, 60,000 and I put 50,000 in over a 10 year period and it's grown to 55,000 people go, well, Hey man, I could have been $5,000 ahead. And I go, okay, now what happens when you die? Mm. My family gets $400,000 tax free. Your family gets $60,000 and then they pay 50% tax and they get $30,000. So that's another great way to escape poverty uh, is by helping the next generation get ahead when you do pass. And the truth is the, the only two things that are certain in life are death and taxes, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed, that's, yeah. When, and and I, know, I know we're about to end here pretty quickly, but let me just harp on just a little, little bit of the title of this video. The title of this video is New Work Order, How to Escape Poverty. Now, not a big conspiracy theorist, um, but let's just say that the new world order, or as I would call it, the new new world order was to keep minorities marginalized to be the servants of rich people. And by doing so, we keep the rich richer and we keep the poor poor. And then you got the people in the middle that we fill those mid-level income jobs so we can support the rich people. Yes. And then the poor people support the, the middle class and the rich people. Okay, now that we know that, what are we going to do right now? Because people would use that as an excuse. Well, it's a new yeah. world order. Uh, the 5G <clears throat> radiation rays are, uh, uh, are killing our brain cells. Okay, now that you know that, what are you going to do now? Yeah. See, see, that's my point about conspiracy theories. You can get so wrapped up and tired, like, well, it don't matter. We do that. We got 5G and we got radiation. And we listen, everybody calm down. Do the social distancing. Wear, wear a mask when you go into establishment. I don't wear them right out my door or when I'm in the park. I don't wear a mask. But when I go into establishment, I wear a mask and I do social distancing. If you believe that 5G is going to kill you, then don't get a 5G phone. Don't use 5G internet. Just use your 2.4 gigahertz. But after you got all through all your conspiracy theories, are you still poor? Are you still low impoverished? Or do you still have low income? Are you not investing? Are you not saving? Are you not researching and um, getting information and educating yourself? Because at the end of the day, those conspiracy uh, theories are just jargon after a while. It's just, just a deflection, right? Understand imagery, imagery and marketing. Those are the two worst things when it comes to consumer, excuse me, consumerism, where it makes you a consumer because of the great marketing, you have to look past marketing, like, do I really need this product? Because we overspend on stuff we don't need. In imagery, now I'm going to harp on this and I'm going to leave it alone. 
CNN was talking about when it first came out about how COVID-19 is highly affecting the African-American community. Could it be part of the new world order? It could possibly be. Cause I'm gonna tell you something, Stephen. when it was an Asian problem in China, they said the Chinese people. Yeah. When it came to America, they said Americans. Then when a high population of African-Americans started to contract the COVID-19 and die, oh, now it's black people. The problem with this country is there's, there's a high level of racism in all forms of mass media and government. But if we stay dis um, distracted by that, we will never be successful. And I appreciate people like you that contacted me to give me this information, because guess what? I never knew about infinite banking. I never knew about cash, cash flow value. And it sounds like a scam, but I did the research on it. It's not a scam. So we can be distracted about the imagery and, and mass media and new world orders. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the true divide in America, the true divide, let's just throw race in his own little corner, is the rich versus the poor. That is the racial divide. When you got money, you can live good. As all the people you see on YouTube, throwing it up, drinking the best whiskey, smoking the best cigars in the best houses, how do they afford that house? Like my buddy Rob, how do you afford that house? He figured out a way to be successful. Yeah. And that is the true divide in America is actually the rich and the poor. Because guess what, ladies and gentlemen, there's poor white people, there's poor Asian people, there's poor Middle Eastern people, there's poor Hispanic people. And on the flip side, there are also rich people of those same diversities, colors, and um, nationalities. They are. Yeah. Yeah, there is. There is. Well, I, I just so appreciate you taking time to get on because I think that this information is so important to get out to people. They need good money uh, mentors. There are so many voices on the internet right now. I don't think people know who to trust or who to look to. And so I, I think you and I bring something to the table that can actually you know, bring value to, to people's lives. So I just, I just want to thank you again for being on here. And I, I just want to say one more thing. If you're watching this live uh, or you're on my channel, check out Financial Literacy, get subscribed to them. If you're not subscribed to my channel, do that. We, we talk about different topics, but you can look me up on YouTube at Stephen Gardner. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. Hey, Ray, thank you so much uh, for, for being on here. Um, if somebody wants to get a copy of my book, I will send you a free copy of Taming Wall Street. I'll put a link in here and, and Ray can put one. But if you go to yourbridgeplan.com forward slash Ross dash world, like is on his t-shirt, then you can request a free copy and, and Ray's going to help get that out. Um, we're just going to email them right now so that Amazon can keep focusing on getting medical supplies to people. But this is a great time to learn about finance uh, from, from uh, financial literacy. It's a great time to learn about finance from me. But thank you again for being on here. We'll get all your listeners a free copy of the book. Well, thank you for the free books again. Believe me, um, I know you had a good turnout of people requesting the books. Um, thank you for your time, Stephen, the information, the value you brought to my channel. And to all the people who are listening in, um, either on Stephen's channel or my channel, um, continue to practice social distancing. If you're going out into establishment, I encourage you wear a mask. Um, my background, if anybody wants to know, um, in the Army, I was a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear uh, specialist. So the mask does help out a little bit and also social distancing help out. I have done work with the CDC, um, the EPA, and as well as OSHA. So I'm hoping right. that information helps somebody and all the information that me and Steven gave out. Again, Steven, I can't thank you enough. Um, what a great opportunity to work with you once again. Okay, sign off. I, I know you have your, your sign off about live, learn money and be rich, something like that. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, everyone. This is Ross World along with Steven Gardner. Learn money and be inspired. We're out.